me try to figure this out. Oh, that works too. <laughs> okay, well, we are live now, so let's get moving. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our Women's History Month panel. Um, really excited about the panelists that we have on today. Um, we're focusing on women and science and policy, and uh, we've got a great group of women leaders here with us. Um, firstly, I I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Kaso Willie. I am the staff attorney for Save California Salmon, um, and I live and work in Sacramento. Um, and just to start out, we have a couple of announcements from Save California Salmon. Um, firstly, we have um, some big events coming up um, for the Bay Delta. There is a um, voluntary agreement hearing happening in Sacramento, April 24th to the 26th. And we will be holding a rally for commenting um, and people to participate on April 26th, which is a Friday. And to attend virtually, um, you can register at tinyurl.com slash VA dash speaker. Um, and you can also find those links and more information on our social media. Um, for up in Orleans, we are holding a free Undam the Klamath film night uh, with Shane Anderson of Swift Water Films. Um, and local dam removal advocates and filmmakers on April 18th at 6.30 at the Mid Klamath Watershed Council Panamic Building. Um, food will be, food is available for donation and benefits the salmon run and the on the Klamath and Trinity Rivers. And next we have an Earth Day, we will be attending an Earth Day rally um, in San Francisco at the, their city hall on April 23rd from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And then we are will be participating in open comment at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission in order to support flows in the San Francisco Bay and Bay Delta watershed um, at 1.30 in room 400 at the Public Utility Commission. And lastly, um, we have a petition going for asking the governor to include water for fish in his recent salmon strategy plan that he released um, this spring. And uh, we have a petition up at tinyurl.com slash salmon petition. So we're asking everyone to please sign that petition. And lastly, we're always asking for donations at uh, Safe California Salmon, um, donations go to raft trips, providing food, raft trips, youth education, programming, um, the purchase of merchandise for sale at tabling and things like that, and just really helps keep our programming going and open for the community. Okay, with that, um, I think we'll get started. Um, for the panelists, um, First, we want to do introductions. So if you can sort of go around and tell us about your work, yourself, and a little bit about the inspiration that you have. And um, I think we'll start with Anacita. I have her up first on my screen. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Well, really an honor to be here, especially amongst so many strong. Um, and especially, I, I, is this the majority everyone's year off? Um, on it, so I, I, this it's really a great honor. So I'm the executive manager at the Department of Water Resources, and we've just recently renamed my my office to the from the Office of Tribal Policy Advisor to the Office of Tribal Affairs. So I've been doing this work um, for this is my tenth year with the Department of Water Resources, and prior to that, I did five years at the Department of Justice, and I was um, working with the Office of Native American Affairs. Um, here in Sacramento, but I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Um, my my traditional clans is um, Bitter Water, uh, Twitty Chitney on my mother's side, and I'm born for Ilocano on my father's side, which is Filipino. So I was raised in the Central Valley of California, and so a lot of the water issues that are really strong and um, resonating with me, what inspired me was, you know, being, my father was a farm worker, 
uh, in, in the grape industry where I worked in those fields. And, you know, it was very prevalent about the, the, the ag, ag industry, especially seeing um, from the 70s, the 80s, the ag industry changed from small farms to more corporate farming and then being very much aware of what was going on with the, um, well, not realizing there was two systems of water in California, a federal system and a, a California system, but just realizing um, that water delivery system there in the in the Central Valley area. So I never realized I actually would be in working in water um, coming from that. So the whole the whole story of that is a uh, is 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 um, quite interesting for me because I would never have imagined or dreamed that this is where I would end up in policy. Um, but policy was an area I was always it was interested in. Um, but just really excited about doing the work because my job is to um, represent the Department of Water Resources on all the programs and projects that we work on uh, throughout the state with all the tribes in California. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Tara Lynn, would you like to go next? Thanks, Gazelle. Skoya Nastuen, Nakna Tara Lynn of Kenya. Hekta Essi Morg Mewamechak, Pnamnik Ak. My name is Terilyn Apina. I'm from the villages of Hekta and Morg along the Klamath River, and I serve as the Chief Operations Officer for the Yurok Tribe. Also honored to be here. And um, I also serve as the uh, Vice President for the Preganish Corporation. And um, my job actually has grown from um, for the last 20 years, I actually started out as a clerk for the Tribal Council, and 20 years later, I am serving as the Chief Operations Officer for the York Tribe. Um, the, really the highlight of my career and um, has been dam removal. I remember when going to my very first meeting, I think I was like 24 or something like that, and we went to, we went to Redding, and um, we hijacked the meeting. They didn't invite us. We came in. They kicked us out of the meeting. And were and laughed in our face and said, "This that's never going to happen." Laughed at our elders, but um, just uh, the pre what inspires me is like that um, resilience of our people that will not give up and that we will push, um, keep on continuing to push and uh, fight for our people and our resources. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Don. Would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Dawn Blake, soon to be Dawn McQuillan. <laughs> I'm recently married. Um, I, I'm i really also really honored to be a part of this high caliber group um, and just really excited to hear some of the, the stories and the input of the other panelists. Um, I I guess I've had a career for about 20 years. Um, I was schooling before that. And um, I started as a wildlife biologist and working for the Hoopa tribe. And um, and during that time, so at some point, I really don't remember when I became um, the chair of the Hoopa Education Association Board of Directors. I've never been able to just spout it off the top of my head. <laughs> um, um, and then more recently came to the Yurok Tribe and I'm now the Yurok Tribe Forestry Director. And last year um, I became a member of the, of the Board of Forestry, which oversees CAL FIRE and um, and makes the the um, forest practice rules. So that's um, my experience with science and policy, I guess. And I'm just excited to be a part of this panel. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Would you like to go next? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Jamie Holt, and. Uh, I am a Yurok tribal member. I come from the village of Wachpoos, which I also have the honor of working at every day and living right above, which is nice. Um, I'm starting my 26th year working for our fisheries department. So I'm definitely on the science end of this meeting here. Um, like Tara Lynn said, uh, you know, dam removal was essentially a pipe dream when, when this started. And uh, to see how fast it's kind of coming to fruition, um, 
yeah, I never thought that I would actually have a, a career as it is, but here I am. So um, uh, very grateful to be on this panel. Um, I think I'm definitely the least, um, uh, uh, I guess, school educated, if you will, but uh, definitely river educated and learning how my science interacts with policy and how it truly makes a difference. Um, a lot of my inspiration is definitely my family. Um, we come from the river. I was raised on it. And uh, I, I really got this job because I knew how to drive a jet boat. And, um, you know, here we are all these years later uh, with all the science behind some jet boat driving. So, again, grateful to be here. Great. Thank you. And Brooke. Hi. Um, that actually transitions really well into what I want to say, too, because so a little bit of background. I'm from Klamath, California, where I grew up with my dad on the Klamath. Um, we'll take me what my cook, uh, Oda Glawe, say, Pichuklawe, uh, Santa Cruz Uk, Sundabri, Eureka Uk. Um, so I'm, I'm from the Watak village, and right now I'm living in Santa Cruz, California, where I'm pursuing a PhD in environmental studies on how to better integrate indigenous knowledge into California water policy. And I also study how the spring and fall salmon in Chinook and the Klamath River differ from nutrient value and also from DNA to hopefully better protect our spring salmon runs in the future, since there's two different words for spring and fall salmon in many of our languages. And yet that hasn't been really recognized by the scientific and by like scientific, I mean like academic science community, because we've recognized it for a long time. And kind of what Jamie was saying is I grew up on the river too, and I'm pursuing this PhD to try to support tribal members' voices and pretty much give a backing being like, you know what, we've been saying these things and just because we don't have a college education doesn't mean what we're saying isn't valid and scientific. And I also have a background with a BS in civil engineering from Portland State University with a minor in political science where I also was the intern for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., under Tom Udall of New Mexico, and a master's in environmental engineering with a focus on water resources and hydrology from Stanford University. And yeah, I'm so blessed to be on a panel as a 20-something-year-old with all these amazing women that I look up to in my own community. So it feels like such a pleasure to be here. And actually, tonight, I'm moving back up to Eureka um, from Santa Cruz, so trying to make that Salmon full cycle back home. <laughs> oh, and also I used to be an intern for Save California Salmon. I should probably mention that too. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, so Brooke, you sort of went into this a little bit, um, but I wanted to ask those that work in the science field, um, what sort of inspired you to go into science? Um, I mean, it's such a technical field. And I feel like growing up, people don't usually think like, oh, I'm going to be a biologist or something like that. It's sort of unique. And so if you could, those that work in science, if you could speak a little bit to what inspired you to take this field on. Uh, I really liked education, but I didn't start out in science by any means. And I was really intimidated, like really intimidated by science. And there were two specific instances um, once when I spoke to the man who would become my boss when I was doing a, just a college internship at the forestry department in Hoopa, I had the opportunity to talk to the wildlife biologist there and asked him, um, you know, what his job was, a wildlife biologist, and how he got there. So he told me that he had a bachelor's of science and a master's of science and told me like the kinds of courses, um, you know, that he had to take and about his, a little bit about his thesis. And I was like, okay, so I won't be a biologist. <laughs> and then um, another, another time when I was, um, when I was at CR and really didn't have, um, I really didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do um, career wise. And one of my friends, lifelong friends was in, she was a pre-med at Humboldt State University and um, and told me about this exciting program for um, for um, underrepresented people to be funded in the sciences. 
And so she really was encouraging me to apply for that. And I told her, I will never in my life be a science major. Thank you, but I will never be a science major. So from that, um, just in deciding what I wanted to do with my career, really um, my decision and what led me in that direction was wanting to work outdoors. And that led me to science. And there was no way around it. If I wanted a job outdoors, it was going to have to be um, a science degree. So I picked a broad one and it's just um, crazy to me to think back to a time when I really thought that I couldn't do it. It was definitely hard, but I thought it was impossible before I started. Um, I definitely agree with Dawn. I needed to work outside. <laughs> I am uh, not an inside worker. Um, uh, for me, I had lots of um, uh, leaders to look up to and big dreamers like Tara Lynn mentioned before. And um, I really came to have an understanding of the science I was capturing as we were capturing it. And um, a lot of the science that we have got over the gotten over the years has become um, out of necessity. Um, one thing that I can use is our 2002 fish kill um, that made us up our science game on the technician level all the way to the, you know, our top, our top biologists. And uh, that was really just getting out there and eyeballs on fish and those kinds of things. And to understand the importance of learning that science on the fly and how important it is for policy, um, you know, that directly correlates to flows that come on down, you know, to hopefully give some fishies some some extra flow for disease control and different things. But um, again, you know, I was just, we had big dreamers and um, just really, you know, they were really leading the way and just kind of followed right on with them. And uh, um, it's been really amazing to see us be able to fill in the gaps um, with our inherent uh, native knowledge. Um, like right now, you know, the dogwoods are blooming. Um, that means the sturgeon are returning. So we can actually scientifically combine those things now, you know, with with flow and, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> coinciding with those returns. So when I talk to kids, I always tell them we were the original scientists. We were the original ichthyologists. We were the original foresters out there. Um, this is our arena. This is our game. And uh, I'm very grateful that this did evolve into a uh, profession. Yeah, I, I can add on that to that too, from my experience with the 2002 fish kill as well. Um, right. I was seven years old when the 2002 fish kill happened. And I remember that morning very clearly. And for me, because right, when you have little kids, you get to this age where you just ask why all the time, like, oh, why is this this way? Why is the sky blue? Um, why do we do this? And so that happening to me at like that as developmental time in my life where I'm just like, then why are these fish dying? Why did this have to happen? Why did this happen to us? Why does that have to be like this way? How do we stop this from happening again? And kind of having that almost like anxiety, not having those really solid answers at the time since, right, this has never happened to our tribes historically. With interviews with elders, there's nothing like that that's happened before. And the fact that happened so quickly is really scary to, you know, a little kid like I was. And I felt like I could maybe find some of those answers through a combination of science and policy. And that was one of the first things. But then also my dad's a construction worker. Um, his name's Willie Thompson. And, you know, he's one of my biggest inspirations and in seeing him help build up our reservation from when we were young, right? He's doing measurements and taping things out and showing me how to build things and teaching me geometry. And so that really inspired me to be like, okay, my, my dad's building these buildings how do I learn how to make the building more successful and that pushed me into wood shop in high school and then my wood shop teachers encouraged me to go into engineering and I didn't really know what civil engineering was at the time and I'm thankful for those good role models I had who were like you know this is what civil engineering is this is why it can be helpful for you and you know if nothing else you'll learn a thing or two if you hate it you can do architecture or something else but I, I as second I got into engineering I loved it and being able to describe the world. And it also became really useful when, um, right, for example, the LNG pipeline, it was an organ that was stopped after like 15 plus years. I found out when I was in engineering, I could then apply these scientific concepts and then back them up with these tribal concerns being like, you know, 
we are have concerns about the waterways being crossed and what happens if leaks happen. But then from the engineering side, I could be like, hey, I know this is like where the design is for this pipeline. And these are the parameters. And there's this likelihood that these parameters are not going to be met or there's only these many people to inspect pipelines for the whole um, country. And it takes them about this long to respond and like have those really specific concerns about infrastructure that then go hand in hand with the tribal concerns. And it felt like being able to marry those two and support um, my family and be, do something I was really interested in and kept learning from just like fit really well for me. And it's been something I've loved every single day. Because again, what Jamie was saying is we have, we're naturally scientists in our blood and our genetics. It's just that college aspect and that school education that's the other piece of it but doesn't mean that you're not a scientist just because you don't have a fancy degree yeah great thank you um a lot of great inspirations it seems like you all had really good people to help you along the way and mentor you which is really important I think for youth going in especially native youth going into any field so it seems like you guys had a really good support system. Um, okay, now for switching a little bit to policy, um, what are some of the greatest challenges that you face being a woman in a position of power um, in fields that typically, you know, are dominated by men, um, especially, or historically at least have been dominated by men? Would you like to go first, Anasita? I'll do for you too. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not. I don't know if this specifically is towards like geared towards a woman, but just being a native a native person, um, deal like dealing in the policy space. So dealing with the Fed on the federal level and the state levels, being like um a native person, you are underrepresented, and then you feel like you have to do. The education of like what is sovereignty what is a tribe what how does our government work how do we and then they expect you to speak for all the tribes 109 or 110 in california so um really pushing you to that space to where um they want you to be the token indian i don't know if that's a pushing a little bit hard but a lot of times i will feel like that when i'm in um Sacramento or um, DC that I mean ask these things and I'm, and that's supposed to be for all tribal nations. Um, and as far as being a woman, I think it's just really um, challenging for their work home life balance with small children and like wanting to have this like labor of love for your people but then also balancing out what does that mean for your family? What does that mean when I'm in Sacramento all the time like testifying? Um, so just some of my thoughts right there. Yeah, no, I, to I totally agree with that. Um, but what I've seen, um, and I'm, I've got decades on our panelists here, and and um, but boy, am I so inspired by Don, Jamie, and Brooke, you know what you've done, and and um, you know, and of course, Carolyn, what you mentioned, just your whole career growth and how you were nurtured within your own community, and that's a that that that's policy development because when you're talking about policy on so many different levels, workforce development, you know, strategic planning, what's happening, the business model. Those are those are all those different things. And the way Jamie was mentioning and Brooke and Don about the inherent right we have or our nature as natural scientists. And so, you know, as policy makers or policy, you know, advisors, you know, we're 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 and and coming from an indigenous perspectives, you know, we're having to push this envelope of like policy is more than just the written written legislation, statutory language, the black and white. And in my world, I look at policy as equity and I look at policy as the social, political, cultural, environmental, social justice issues. And most people are like, wow, that's just a lot that you're trying to slam into this new one policy statement. But I just think that that as Native people, that's how we look at it. We're looking at it very holistically. And oftentimes the, the old policymakers did not look at it that way. It was basically a start line and a finish line, get it done, and usually in a very short timeline. And what I've seen in the last couple gener um, decades in, in the in this in the policymaking world is a real stark difference. There was a time when when typically I would be the only female in the room, and typically very very much the only 
person of color and um and then and not having a science background they were like well okay well you're coming from social justice or political science background you know what does that have to do with the hardcore engineering aspects of it so a lot of that was kind of you know um, suppressed in in different ways um but i don't see that so much anymore in the last um you know um it, well in my where i work with in state government it's there's this real um and i'm not working in the private industry so it's probably quite different from that perspective of what um, Native women have to do to support themselves and to push themselves in that policy world. But I think I've seen a real strong shift on state government in support of policy efforts. And the biggest shift is recognizing indigenous science. And I tell you, our department, um, our director has said publicly, indigenous science is best available science. And I can't stress enough how important of a statement that is um, for a Department of Water Resources director to say that. Um, and by saying that, it's not just saying, and we also have that in writing in the California Water Plan update. And all of that has because it's been tribally led information and recommendations to our department as part of a whole you know, tribal engagement strategy. But even though we've said that, it does not mean that any any of our non-white scientists or non-tribal scientists even know what best available science in the indigenous space is. That is still, it, it is still the um, definition has to be tribally led, has to be formulated by the tribal perspective. But I do think that by saying that, we're making that acknowledgement that that is where we're going to get that information. And my job as a policy advisor is to make sure that space stays open like that that somebody doesn't come up with this random definition and and which we see oftentimes in legislation. We have an opportunity always to look at new legislation and make comments. And they're like, oh, here's here's the new definition of TEK. And we're gonna adopt it by everyone because it's needed. And you know, I I put in my two cents and say you can't have a statewide definition. You can have an acknowledgement of it, but it's gonna be different for every tribe and every every community. And but anyhow, that's just some some of my my um my experiences in in, in um, just dealing with that one area area of that and um but but it's but it's, it's exciting though to see the changes and to to really see the changes and see more women come into the to the science and policy space. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, oh, go ahead. That what you just said, I mean, we have a lot to talk more after this, too, because I just finished writing a whole paper on the issue with one singular definition for tech when doing water policy in California. And I think that's kind of what happens like being I mean, I haven't been in a position of power, really, <laughs> yet, like some of the other women have here. But, you know, just being a Native woman in the STEM fields and in policy, too, where it's like. There it's almost like I'm still coming to these organizations on their footing because for example, I don't think it's even possible to have a conversation about our meanings of tech in the English language because right, our understanding of land and nature, our understanding of those are different than a Western understanding of those concepts. And so even writing it for me like an English language is like not fully understanding those terms and those concepts. And for me, being in these spaces, it's been like really lonely, honestly, <laughs> like it's especially, you know, in the larger California sense where I feel like I'm often the only, you know, not only the Na only Native American woman in the room, but only the only Native American in a room a lot of times. And I think that's really sad. I think I was told that there's only one other PhD student who's Native American at UC Santa Cruz right now. And just that fact alone that you know, there's not that much community here. And again, hence one of the reasons I'm excited to move back to Eureka and, um, you know, be able to have that community support. But I think also um, for me, it's knowing that there's also different types of support and community that we can work together with. Like the African-American community has been really supportive to me in Portland and in DC. And the fact that like those women are also facing these stigmatizations and these issues and they've always had my back knowing what that's like too and so recognizing you know even if there's few of us in these spaces and that can be lonely 
we can still share similar similarities in our struggles and our cultures and use that to help bring everyone up. And I, yeah, there's no reason that we should have to be separate. And so I also want to shout out to my friends and family who've also been in engineering and policy that have been having my back when it's been rough and these spears where it feels like <laughs> dealing with the history of colonization and how these laws and policies have been created seems like too much that it's not just any one of us fighting it it's all of us as a community and that we have a lot of support and love to give to each other yeah no that's good yeah we, we definitely need to talk further because um jamie mentioned it about western science and when we see western science not making room and trying to that translation and so i'm so excited about where you're going with your research um, an example is of CEQA. CEQA is so important to California. And what, 10 years ago, we did amended CEQA in order to have a new definition of what a tribal cultural resource is and with statutory requirements, but even just the definition of, of how to define a tribal cultural resources is all based on this typical Western concept of built resources from that archeological point of view. And so that again is another and you know, we have to break that entire shift of like, you don't have words. How do you how do you describe a feeling of place? And, and that is one of the um, one of the requirements of the amended resource uh, tribal cultural resources talking about landscapes. And so I mean, and it's kind of a perfect examples of, of how do you make put words into a sense of feeling of place for a particular culture based on a particular place that many cultures probably have different um, positions and have have, um, you know, have utilized that same sacred place, but use it differently, have prayed there differently at different times. And so those are the different things that, on translation. And and that that's happening now in policy on so many things statewide in California that's being done now. Yeah, awesome. Um, thank you for those responses. I think a lot of really good information sharing. And I think um, a lot of opportunity for improvement in the policy realm, for sure, um, that, you know, we can help all of us, I think, can help um, make that change. Um, and so this next question is sort of for the group. Um, was it hard to break into the field that you're in now, um, being a Native woman from coming from a rural area and then you know, moving to Sacramento or um, be going to university in a different city or anything like that. Um, was it was it hard for you to make that transition? And anyone can hop in. I'll jump in. Um, I don't know if I've ever I've ever considered myself like breaking into policy. And I think Jamie spoke to this before that it came out of a necessity and inherent responsibility at the tribe that we needed people that who were tracking legislation, who were being policymakers, who were leading the way. And I remember being like early on in my career and Jamie talked about this, like these big dreamers and leaders. So I think of like Troy Fletcher and Howard McConnell and sitting in the room and hearing them like whiteboarding it out saying we're going to get all this land back we're going to remove the dams and then looking at me saying well you need to do this and I'm like what me like I and then just like it's you know like you just they're just like so empowering you to like you need to step up this is what our people need and this is how we're going to protect our resources this is how we're going to protect our sovereignty we need to pay attention and our people need to whether you feel like you can do it or not you need to learn it and we need to step up <clears throat> I uh, I kind of feel that same way. I sort of carved my my niche where I'm at. And um I was really fortunate to have um being a woman on the river had uh its own difficulties, you know, but putting in the hard work and um who knew Tara that we had the same conversations with the same people but probably in different locations. Um but literally about the same things and you know how how to make these things come to fruition or even how to envision these things for the future. And um, I like to think that, um, you know, there's always been women on the river, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, you know, we've, we've always navigated it. We've always, we've always been on it. And I was also fortunate enough to work with Brooke's dad. Um, 
he he helped me learn to navigate the river in the dark. Um, yeah, a necessity, you know, like Tara said, you know, the, a lot of these were really born out of necessity. Um, you know, you got to drive at night because the fish run more at night. So, you you know, you follow the fish. So um, I like to think also that, you know, as we've carved our way in this, we've definitely opened a door for a lot of different young women, uh, you know, to, to, to have lots of different options, whether it's, um, you know, heading into a policy meeting or um, putting on your rain gear and heading out to, to see some fish, so. That's awesome, Jamie. <laughs> um, I always, I guess I always felt like I was um, a forerunner in my space, you know, not like Brooke said, not really having the support of other natives around and in my fields, in both fields, when I started in the wildlife um, program at Humboldt, uh, I think the the ratio of females to males at that time was like 25, 75. Um, it's entirely turned around now, which is um, exciting in itself. But, um, but I always felt like this, I have to do this so that people can come along behind me and I have to make it easier for someone else to be able to, um, I always felt like I was paving roads for someone else. And that was entirely my driver sometimes because I didn't, I felt like I didn't have it in me to do it for myself, but I could do it for someone else. Um, and so, <clears throat> and then also um, I had strong mentors too, who believed in me. And that was just, that was a pressure that I didn't want. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't want to disappoint, you know, when someone expects something like truly expects something of you, you want to live up to that as, as much as you can. And now, you know, I, I really try to, um, I really try to make sure that I'm supporting other people and youth and trying to um, and impress to them what I see in them and, um, and hopefully help them along the same path the way that I was helped by my mentors. Yeah, adding to what Don said, for me, it was just almost like the audacity to believe in myself, to try to even apply to these things. Because I think sometimes it's easier not to apply than apply and know that, oh, maybe I could have got it, maybe not, versus applying and then, you know, having to deal with the reality, like maybe I won't get accepted to this and there's a very low chance I will. Um, but there's been so many times where I've applied to things that I never thought I was going to get, such as the Gates Millennium Scholarship, which is what allowed me to pay for college. And I got in or the um, the scholarship I applied for the Native American political leadership um, classes and APLP that sent me to D.C. and paid for that. I was like, why, why would they let an engineer go to D.C. <laughs> and learn policy? Um, but they they accepted me and they knew that even though I didn't have a policy background, it's like a lot of the people who are in policy already have it in with a family member or friends who know how things work, know how that world is. And right, it, I think it's hard to break in when you don't have those connections. And yet, you know, just I think putting that effort out there and knowing that if you apply to 20 things, you may only get one, but that one you get, that's the start into opening up more pathways and doors is really useful. But I, it's doing that and applying and taking that step to try to break into these places and also do that networking being like, hey, like I'm not here yet, but this is where I want to be in the future is scary. Um, but I think the more of us that break through and make those initial, you know, trickles into like the damn wall that will eventually be able to build enough pressure where then you'll just see an influx of all of us in these areas. And so I that's my hope, at least being in these spaces too um, and doing the networking. And I do is that I hope that if someone else, like any youth wants to come along and also be in these spaces, they don't have to try to forge all these new paths by themselves. And I can be like, hey, I know this person, this person, this person, and this person can help mentor you. Or this person knows kind of like, what you want to work on so maybe you can connect with them and they can help you out 
and I'll be there to help you out too. So I, <laughs> I think it is hard to break in, but I think almost the hardest part is just believing in yourself and that you can break into these spaces if you want to be here. I like, yeah, I'd love to follow Brooke with that. Like, I totally agree. Um, you know, belief in yourself, but all, all and like, like, um, everyone else said, you know, it's almost kind of like you, the, the position chooses you or you walk into those spaces and all of a sudden you're doing it. Um, I come from a background of working before state government, working with lots of nonprofits in the, in the nonprofit world in a, in a Bay Area community in the Santa Clara Valley. And my work there was all advocacy. And it was, um, you know, the, and, and I think that if you're, if you're an, an activist and you're an advocacy, you're already a policymaker because your goal there is to to put a voice forward that's not often heard, or you you notice there's voids or spaces, or or disengagement, and so those are those are where the policymakers come from, and 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 like Blick said, those doors get closed to us because we don't have those traditional pathways with family members or or the access to a fellowship that will get you into say the capital or get you to to a you know a, a philanthropic organization that does the policy and things unless you come from the back end as an academic type of thing or you're mentored for that. And I've seen so many um advocates coming from even a, a foreign language all of a sudden they're in that policy space and they're making it because they, they feel the same way that who else is going to do it if not them. But I do see that it, as being very effective. And that's what propelled me because when I was doing that, I had no idea I would be working in policy in state government. Um, and then again, doing it in water. Uh, my, my, my area was, uh, was um, looking at, you know, advocating on behalf of uh, lots of nonprofits and developing nonprofits and, and doing incubator programs in San Jose. And, and it was really more women focused and supporting women into political office. And so we had a program and we were, I don't know if any of you um, uh, remember the Emily's list uh, where the, and and so we created something called called the uh, Moon Hairs list. The Moon Hairs means Sp in Spanish women, but we were a, a, a group of women. We had a core group of women that all said that we would donate to campaigns and we all committed a hundred dollars. And we had a core group of 10 and so we, we had an immediate thousand dollars that if anyone, our goal was to put women in political office, uh, PTA boards, uh, local, um, you know, um, school boards, um, nonprofit boards. And then, and at that time in the eighties, Santa Clara had the most um, women in city council, county board of supervisors, our mayor was a, a female. And so there was a really, um, there was a real strong activism of, of women into into politics, into the politics. And we were working on getting local, local elected officials. And then this is before cell phones, so we had this telephone tree. So we all had a group of 10 women who would also be on call to do the, the donation. So we could literally raise by a few phone calls, a core group, a core, a core amount. And we would tell anybody running for office, well, have you talked to Moon Harris? And, and we wanted you to talk to us, have a coffee chat, and let's talk about what your platform is and that, and we do you want our support? And it was an array of women. And that really kind of gave me my idea in terms of like, well, I could do this in policy. We were, we were already making change and we were already affecting that. So I think that, you know, we can't discount whether it's a traditional background in academics or not. I think naturally, um, you know, and I always say this, you know, women carry the water in so many different ways through generations, whether it's the it's the the, the water politics or the you know those bricks that are coming down that have come down on on the climate dam. I mean, we have carried the water, and we always will continue to do so in so many different ways. Yeah, awesome, awesome answers. Um, just sort of going off of where the conversation's going, um, what sort of advice would you give girls and women who are looking to break into these fields? Um, you know, maybe they're saying something that they want to change or something they want to research. Um, is there any advice that you would give them? I 
I, I can go while everyone else thinks their answer. <laughs> um, for me, one is, I think someone said earlier that if you, well, I think honestly, if you're born Native American, you're born as a political actor. I mean, the sheer existence of ourselves and our bodies continuing on this land for me is an act of resistance against the government <laughs> that tried to exterminate us. So for me, um, going along with that, rest is resistance and taking care of yourself. And I think this is something I've struggled with because right, I've been given so many great opportunities and privileges through my education and just through my life. And that I feel like sometimes to feel like I'm worthy of them or to take full advantage of them, I just work myself into the ground and will even work myself sick sometimes because I want to make sure I'm taking full advantage of all of these great things I've been given. But also to take a step back and know that, you know, it's okay to rely on my community sometimes too. And also to be okay with like taking a break and focusing on my mental health and taking that time to reconnect with, you know, what I'm fighting for and spending time by the waterways. Um, or the river or just even outside with the animals and taking that time to just like breathe and knowing that right all this chaos especially <laughs> if you get into this type of field you know maybe going on and there's a weight of the world and how you know how we're going to fix climate change and revitalize our culture etc cetera, etc cetera. but also know that like it's important that we are also part of that culture and that community too and taking care of ourselves is also and taking care of our environment and just taking that tiny time to step aside is also taking care of that community and to know that you're not in it alone and that it's okay to feel stressed and overwhelmed because the world is stressful and overwhelming um but to find time to reconnect with nature and yourself and to take care of yourself and you know we just like we have to get the nutrients back in the water and the nutrient cycle from taking down the dams, we also have to focus on keeping that nutrients in ourselves and, you know, maybe taking a break from writing a paper or, you know, doing all this hard work to have a good meal for ourselves and reconnect in that way too. So that <laughs> I, I think that's honestly like, you think relaxing would come so naturally and be so easy, but I think that's honestly like the best advice I could give is that, you know, it's okay to relax and it's okay to take care of yourself. Thanks, I go ahead, Carolyn. Oh, sorry. Um, I definitely agree with all what Brooke said. And um, I would just add that um, the importance of other women in your life who and fostering those relationships and how important that is within, you know, within our culture, within our religion is like the importance of women supporting other women. And like part of that is taking time for yourself. Um, to renew yourself and um, because especially when we're doing work like this we tend to um, let those boundaries blur and because it's a labor of love they just blend together and really try to set those boundaries so that um, you're not overextending yourself. I was following in the same line about um, you know if you're if you're a young emerging young professional and you're you've you've gone um, you're you're thinking about a, a, a policy career, you know, and you're probably in early 20s. I would suggest um, looking at, um, you know, volunteering for organizations. And that way you can kind of get a sense of like what the corporate culture or that, that nonprofit culture um, going to and, and volunteering in, in different types of institutions to see, do I want to volunteer for an academic institution, a, a, an NGO or a corporate area and and see what you like and then even for government and then maybe identifying early and just reaching out to to women mentors i have been mentored and i have all throughout all throughout 20s on a college years um you know i was babysitting and all of a sudden the people i was babysitting for became my mentors you know it was just it was just um it was just amazing to be able to have that kind of support and and um and then you you and from there you create a network of community to to assist you um even just to just to a person to remind you to slow down and to get good rest um um which is you know one of the best adver adver um, advices i ever received was moisturize and sleep by a woman that i admire in her 70s i said how can you stay so strong and so you're still walking and all she goes i ah, just vaseline every night and get some rest and i'm like 
<laughs> anyway, I always still remember that, but I think, and now every time I think I'm tired, I, I always remember those couple of words in my head about sleep. But the most important thing I think is really identifying mentors early and not being afraid to just reach out to people that people that you see or asking other people who was their mentors or could they suggest a mentor. Um, and and most people that I've, I've mentored or, or sent to other women, they've always had great experiences. So I think that's um, something to to think about. And sometimes we don't think that somebody's going to spend that kind of time with us, but people will. Uh, kind of following into that, it's, um, you know, it's okay to um, find your place also. You don't have to immediately know where you want to be or think that's where you belong. Like Dawn said, you know, sometimes you take the long road to get to where you want and need to be. Um, and I think a lot of that can be taking advantage of your mentors. And um, I'm really fortunate that during my downtime, I'm able to spend with lots of mentors. Um, I'm really fortunate that people come to my office to decompress. So I I, I have the honor of taking um women out to gather roots and different things like that, that, you know, they don't necessarily get to do during their job, but I get to do during mine. And um, it's an extreme fulfillment to, to be able to allow them to have that connection still. Um, like I say within, especially my work is, you know, we all work for the river. So, you know, you got to check in with her every once in a while. She is the boss. So, um, you know, I think uh, extremely fortunate to have had lots of mentors Um and I also know that within this group, I know it's all about strong women, but I also know that we've had some strong men within our lives that um, have enabled us to be strong women and really value that within us. So, uh, you know, don't don't lose sight of those fellows out there, too. Yep. They're some of our biggest fans. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. Um, and um, I guess when I'm thinking about. Um, giving advice it's not just to young girls it's also to young boys because i think that each are such a treasure to us and especially if they can be successful in these fields we need we need everyone and their passion you know to tag on to what we're doing and i haven't ever really um encouraged anyone to follow directly in my my footsteps because i don't know what the i don't know what the challenges of the future are um and I think that that's where our kids are going to be, you know, as as we have spoken to them and as they've kind of uptaken some of the stuff um, like we have from from people who are talking in in our communities, they're going to find their own path and their own passions to go forward. And that's what I'm hoping for. And so when I'm talking to um, to the youth um, or people who haven't really chosen their career yet. I just try to inspire them that I found something that's really um, suited for me. And um, this is really, really broad. And there's a lot of different directions, like it radiates from here, the different directions that you can take and, um, and find something that is going to be um, fulfilling to you, but also beneficial to your people. And I think that that's what um, really brings us together is that passion for wanting to do something and feeling really compelled um, to do something for our own people. And I feel like um, I feel like I do that. I feel like this group does that, and I am confident that our our young people are going to take that up and also do that, like our predecessors. Okay, add, adding on to that really quickly too. The I just want to say that the job you may want as a young person now may not exist right now. Like there may be jobs that currently don't exist and you can help invent jobs too. Like things are not rigid. And I think that's one of the misconceptions I had growing up. It's like, you can create jobs. Like you can start a business, right? Maybe you can be like at your own job, like dam demolisher, like, right? It can be your full job just to figure out how to take down dams. And that wasn't a job previously. When I started civil engineering, there wasn't a civil engineer that worked for the Yurok tribe yet. And I was just hoping that the tribe would need an engineer one day. And now I work part-time as a restoration engineer for the Yurok tribe. And so, right, don't be afraid to dream big because if you want a job and it doesn't exist, you know, you can totally create that job and we can figure out how to make that happen. 
Yeah, I love that. That's a really good answer, especially growing up like as climate change has been developing. I feel like there are so many more environmental science jobs, environmental focus jobs than there was when I was born for sure. So that's definitely um, a positive. I think it's having that that open endedness for careers. Um, so another question sort of for everyone are um, what types of cha changes would you like to see in your work um, and in California in policy and science? What I would think would be extremely helpful is that we have uh, Native Americans in the state legislature and the Senate and the assembly. Right now there's only one Native American, uh, assembly member James Ramos, and he has been extremely influential in changing policy in California. And if we had more people at the table making those decisions, I think that um, it would be better for all of us. Um, personally, I would add just more accountability when sexual har harassment happens in the workplace, because I, I mean, on it, I like being for really for real, like in civil engineering, because it's, I think it's only like 12%, 13% women. Like I have heard some stories that have been like really scary um, and uncomfortable. And I like, am so surprised that you know, some of these people who get called on HR by like, will still make it up in higher positions, like just a few years later. And it makes it, it makes someone like me, like hesitant to be in like these larger, like, for example, engineering firms or places, or even like in the federal government, I've known some like sketchy things to go on with like men making women feel uncomfortable in these workspaces. And it's just like, I want a future where we can just do our work and feel comfortable. Like, <laughs> doing our jobs without the threat of like if we want to take action if something bad does happen there won't be any um, repercussions and so I mean that is more like on a serious note but like you know making sure that there are real repercussions and you know that we aren't just teaching women that they need to be conservative or to watch themselves but teaching our men especially growing up that they need to check their other fellow men and that you know to be help protect women in these workplaces and these spaces where we're not as represented and to make sure that we hold each other accountable because we can't do as high quality of work as we want if you know these gender disparities are happening in the workforce so you know better accountability um and I is something that like they don't teach me in school but I have seen and heard from in the workplace that I, I don't know what the answers are there, but I think something needs to change in those spheres with male dominated fields. Yeah. I'll be super quick. My 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 recommendation is wage parity. Um we really, really need to have, you know, um, especially these new jobs that are being created and they're asking so much. And and if you come from a, a non-traditional background, like how how are you balancing that? So I really do think um we are we are underpaid women in general or all, at all levels of what we do and what we contribute to to workplace. Okay. Um Jamie or Don, do you have any changes you'd like to see in your work or you're okay with those answers? <laughs> I guess I've just, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Don. Yep. Um, I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, I looked this up just as a simple number for a presentation, but realized that, um, you know, the, the late native land base across the entire state of California, when we're talking about these policies, the, the, the space that we occupy is like, 0.01% of the entire space. And most of that is Hoopla and Yurok, if you think about it, the two um, largest reservations in California. And that's still just, you know, barely a sliver. And so I'm really appreciating the land, the land back 
um, campaign, but then just thinking about, you know, what both tribes have done with, um, you know, with their, with their land and always doing something holistic that is going to be sustainable for our future. We're always thinking ahead and still trying to maintain the integrity of our past as well. And so I guess I'm not really sure what the answer is in that, but I've been contemplating it a lot. And the United States government has a trust responsibility to us as people, both our health. And I feel like there are so many opportunities for the, the land back initiatives to actually um, help us to sustain the landscape and um, ultimately put back into our actual health too. So I don't have a real clear answer for what change that is, but something needs to happen and, and, and I'd like to um, brainstorm with you all <laughs> about it. Uh, mine is actually kind of similar to that. Um, my world within this is pretty small. It's very river based. But within the river, what I see is um, as far as like native fishermen, um, you know, 80 percent of our catch is completely documented, whereas on the non native side. And again, I don't know what the answer to this is, but um, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of take from our resources. Um, you know, how how do non-native people be held accountable? And what does that place look what what does our place at that table look like? Um, and uh I think kind of speaking to the land back is I think the more that's kind of you know reclaimed, the more we're able to maintain, I, I hate to use the word control, but you know, at least oversee and kind of have an understanding of what's going on. We have a very good understanding of the native usage of our resources, but that that opposing in, and not to say that it's being um, overutilized or anything, it's just not being documented at all. So again, don't really know how that gets changed, but within my world, I, I see that as something that could definitely use some change. Yeah, I think that's where policy steps in. <laughs> um, okay, so last couple of questions. Um, this one's pretty general, uh, but what gives you all hope for the future? Oh, um, for me, I think it speaks to what we just spoke about is uh, those changes are happening that it's, it's, um, it's coming. And, you know, to see young ladies like Brooke to have a completely different understanding of, of how our river is utilized. And not only that, but she takes a different understanding to those other tables. Um, you know, and we've got more and more of these young people at these seats. We've got people like Tara in positions that, I mean, I know that we probably never dreamed that you'd be at a table like that 20 years ago. And, uh, now you couldn't imagine being anywhere else. So for me, um, you know, the inspiration is happening every day, daily, um, you know, on a lot of different facets. It's not even just within the natural resources. Like there's so many people holding down so many different things. Like it is, it's truly inspiring across the board uh, for me. Yeah. I, again, entirely agree with you, Jamie. Um, the things that we we um, talked about 20 years ago or 30 years ago are happening now. And I and I feel like that that's really reminded me of um, the things that a lot of the elders used to say when I was a little kid. You don't hear it as much now, but like, don't say that or it might happen or or you say what you want to happen. And so some of these things are being spoken into existence. And I understand that a lot more spiritually now. And, um, and so I uh, try to be careful about what I say and I, and I really, um, maintain that I have to pray, you know, that's prayer is so important. And when other people come to our spaces and talk about like, you know, they like to say things like, um, if it's not, if this happens, it's when this happens. And I'm like, don't say that, <laughs> you know, the, the Sudden Oak death doesn't occur on the Hoopa Reservation and it doesn't occur on the Yurok Reservation. That's all around. And and I feel like that kind of thing that's that are just these um these pathogens that are following these hard boundaries, you know, up until this point. I really feel that I really genuinely feel like that's that's because of prayer and that's because of um 
of it's an example of um, speaking things that you want to happen and that you don't want to happen. And I think that you always have to be careful about that. And it also also starts to um, cause other people to say the same thing. So, you know, something that we didn't think could happen is actually just happening in front of our eyes now. But that energy comes from a lot of people speaking it and doing the work, but speaking it is really important for what we want to see. I'll jump in there. Um, definitely agree with J Jamie and Don. Um, don't want to repeat what they said, but what I, I don't know if I identify too much with hope, but more think about um, resilience of our people and that long line of indigenous um, family that we all have and that um, it's our responsibility for the survival and continuance of the people and that inherent sense of who we are, that we come here with purpose and that we um, can't be driftwood. And I think that's in all of us, right? So um, just the sense that our people um, will continue to be resilient and um, like invisibility is no longer a survival tool for us now. It's more of that visibility. Like we're in these spaces, we're in DC, we're in Sacramento, we're in, um, in other countries fighting a dam removal. But um, just that resilience, I guess, is like a tool that I would think about as like a alternative to hope. I love that comment about um, invisibility is no longer our survival tool because I understand that completely. And no, and I, yeah, every everything that has been said, but I'm inspired by all of your work and, you know, as, as leaders and and it's, it's so inspiring, but I think my, my comment is that I see um, the, the younger generation being, being, having to, because we're such a, everything is so fast and our young people are growing up so fast and there's so much responsibilities on them, but I do see them stepping up to the plate. And I do think as, you know, uh, in my role is just to make sure that I'm there as a guide if, if they need one, you know, and, and being, being prepared to, to, to offer any help, any support, any mentorship, um, and for them, because they are the next generation. And, and just like Brooke said, we don't know what the jobs were. I mean, I had no idea that I just, I think majority of our jobs probably didn't exist, you know, two decades ago. And I know definitely my mine didn't exist. And so, and I'm probably on my fourth career of, of doing work in the policy arena of, of things. So um, the hope is, is that um, on the policy side, state policy continues to recognize, you know, more, more holistic approach to what we're doing in the natural environment space and not, you know, not fall into the old world style of extractive technologies and how we, when we, when we start new policies and, and just using the old playbook and the new voices, the new generations that are going to break, break out of those old molds, which it can easily be done. Because if you look at legislation or legislators, how many of them are aged into the in, are fixed into the system, and they're the ones creating that language on that old style playbook. And until we can break into that that space of those, even those those new thought processes and those new thought leaders in there, um, you know, we're going to get legislation that has antiquated policy thoughts, and we're going to have to translate that into where we where we want it to go. And that's a big that's a big hurdle to do. Um, in, in my role of when you get le legislation that passed down to you and so many new legislators and like Terrell, I think you started out at the top of the hour, they expect one individual to be the voice for all tribes or have that one that one answer. And it's like, oh, and then we've, we've made the outreach. So that's my hope is, is that, there, that other people get educated and they don't require each of us to have to be the only people doing the educating for them at, at that particular meeting. Yeah, building on that, um, you know, a lot of things resonated with me. One with the resistance. I mean, for me, like hearing the stories from like my I walk Picha with my grandpa's time and his parents' time, and like it is really, it's like they survived an apocalypse. Like the things they have had to go through back when the area was first being colonized, it is just like almost 
seems like it felt I would feel like it was the end of the world and like even during the salmon kill it was feeling like the end of the world to me and yet here we are like 20 how are you how long like 20 over 20 years now <laughs> later right and then and I got to see the dam like one of the dams be removed already and like that is insane to me like the fact I grew up with the adults being told that this would never happen with the dam removal that it was an impossible task that we are wasting our breath and that we should be like you know focusing on other things and yet it's become a reality I mean there's been a lot of ups and downs and I can't imagine especially the adults at the time who were working on the policy side of it how <laughs> strenuous that was but you know just from my side as a tribal citizen like going to the protests year after year after year and just how exhausting that was. But, you know, if we didn't have that hope to begin with that this future was even possible, it would have never been possible. It would have been a self-fulfilling prophecy, kind of what we were talking about being spoken into existence. Like we have to believe in a better future to even start working towards it. And for me too, like that also goes with like the prayer and going to ceremony and being able to you know, do basket weaving and all those good thoughts and that love that goes into that weaving and to the thoughts of like the future generations that will hopefully get those baskets and the love that goes into the care that we put into our environment right now and for world renewal. You know, for me, that's all interrelated into hope. And for me too, it's also like the youth I come in contact with. Like there is some people doing like, and, that, and that's kind of one of the reasons I focus on like rest and relaxation and that, um, because I, I meet a lot of people who are even younger than me doing such cool, amazing things around the world. Like I've had the privilege to go to 15 different coastal countries around the world. And I've met youth that are trying to make differences in their own fishing and river communities everywhere. And they're making really big impacts. Like there's like teenagers starting businesses and cleaning up their rivers and help supporting their families, and environments and communities. And you know, no one gave them permission to do so. No one was like, oh yeah, this is the sustainable job to choose or this is what's the right path. Like they just saw a need in their community and were like, you know, this is my future and this is what's important to me and my family. And so I'm just going to do it and I'm going to figure out a way. And seeing their impact inspires me all the time because then I'm like, okay, how can I do better to then support you? And then you can support me. And then it's, we can be supportive of each other, not only in like in our own communities or as California tribes, but as international tribal people and indigenous peoples, we can help support each other and reach these goals. And I think together, knowing that in the time of technology and communication and computers, I remember trying to explain what a phone was to my Pichawas and he was just not getting it. <laughs> and like, but, you know, like now we have this technology, which, you know, can be a burden at times and really stressful, but it also creates this new opportunity to communicate with indigenous peoples around the world and help support each other in ways we've never had the opportunity to before. And so that I think makes the future really exciting. And I'm happy that I get to be here along for the ride and support the next generation, but also, you know, kind of push the generation above me to keep their steam going after <laughs> kind of being worked down by the system for so many years. So we can all, you know, work with each other to make this future a reality. And I'm excited to see that future. Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask one question from the Q&A before I ask you all to close out. Um, so this question says, I love all of the work you are doing and the passion you do it with. I often ask myself the question, about using, quote, using the master's tools to dismantle, dismantle the master's house. And I wonder how you work with that idea. And it's an open-ended question to anyone. Um, I think for me, from the science, and I spoke on it a little bit earlier, but we're, we're um, you know, scientifically, we are able to match up our, um, you know, our stories from thousands that are thousands of years old, you know, we are able to match these to to inherent data sets, as we like to call them now. Um, you know, so we are able to, you know, we're able to play that game with our tools. Uh, for me, that that is a part of dismantling it is showing just how incredibly valid our form of science is and how it matches up within their form of a valid science. So that's for me personally. 
I um I was gonna say this earlier, but when I was in school and trying to talk, you know, my my fellow coworkers into going to school and it was intimidating to them. They're like, you can do it, I can't do it. I'm like, well, you can because it's just jargon. Um, my expert, I realized at some point that my expertise was just jargon. It was this language that I was learning um, of a particular field. And so I really always felt like I'm learning that language so that I can be a bridge to my own community. And they don't have to go and necessarily put the time into learning this particular language. I can relay what I know back to back to my own people. And I've, I've tried to do that. Um, and I feel like that sort of, um, you know, hopefully that will tack on to what some, someone else is doing. And, um, and I'm not sure how it is for other people, but that's always what I thought, you know, that I just, I'm doing this not so that I could go and become something else. I'm doing this so that I could um, relate the, the language or, or do something about the language barrier. And it's taken, I mean, it's called professional development, but it's taken us decades to get past this major language barrier in order to, um, build these relationships and have, um, that influence, um, to get the bigger things done. Whereas we were just kind of stuck at not being able to communicate with each other before. So, um, that, those are my thoughts. For me, kind of building on that metaphor, I think it was like using um, the master's tool to dismantle the master's house. For me, I think about that in a sense with traditional ecological knowledge, how I think there's a misconception that traditional knowledge and Western knowledge are di like metrically opposed to one another. And for me, they're not. They're just both different types of tools. And one has just been underappreciated for a while. And for me, I don't know why they can't work together. Why can't we, you know, take what we learn from Western knowledge and apply it to our traditional ecological knowledge and vice versa to make both stronger? Like, you know, when it comes to like, for example, an elk scooper, like an elk bone scooper, right? We can figure out how to make it sharper using Western metals techniques, or we can <laughs> wear our safety glasses, <laughs> you know? I, they can help each other out. And I don't think a tool is inherently a good or bad thing. It just depends who's using it and for what reason. And so let's use those tools for good and not like say one is better than the other, but you know, it's that coming together of community and figuring out how we use both those types of tools to make it even more efficient to build up a new system that really supports everyone instead of one specific type of group of people to benefit everyone. I'd like to, to follow that. Um, and in, in my world, you know, the tool sets we use is language. And it's, I feel like my role is a translator. And just like the Jamie was mentioning, um, but it's all about translation. It's all about grounding um, definitions and terms and um, and not, not making the assumption that everybody's reading the same paragraph or the same policy statement or the same legislation the same way. And so much of policies interpretation it's subject to whomever's reading it and implementing it. And, and you know, that's why with state, we have all these guidelines and regulations trying to make sure that so much of it does not come out of that subjective world that somebody says, this is it, and that's that. Um, so it's um, really, and, and you get you can get in so much of the fine print when you're trying to implement policy. You, you've heard the stories about use may versus might and shall or not. I mean, they, you get into the weeds there, but I really do think that if you have, um, you know, you can develop, you can develop what, what are your definitions and make it really clear, especially if you're in a position of decision making, or if you're a person that's advising decision makers of really being very clear what, what you're translating on behalf of the community. And then again, not making the presumption that what you're translating is the community's wishes. If you have to also then say that this is what the community wants or needs, you have to do your due diligence to make sure that you're actually addressing and propelling the community first. And so there's so many 
points along that that can get disjointed or somebody could just take advantage and say, well, I've already done my outreach. This is what it is based on what they think. So I really do think, you know, the, 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 the language, the tool of language is so, so important and it's, it's always going to be a challenge and you just have to really be careful. Um, and hopefully, um, as we heard earlier, that there's good actors, there's good people with the good intentions uh, that are advancing that. Um, to build on that also, like the use of language, um, just want to highlight some of the missing and murdered Indigenous peoples um, assembly bills and Senate bills that the Yurok tribe has been co-authoring and sponsoring. And that is um, sort of like a new tool Yurok has been using. Previously, we had not co-authored bills, but usually, uh, you know, actually walking through the text of the bill with the assembly member or the Senate person walking um, uh, in Sacramento and uh, lobbying with folks and just really using their language and their uh, legislative process to help our people and get funding to our area to fight the MMIP crisis. Yeah, I appreciate all of the answers. Um, I think there's a lot can, that can be done. And I think those are all really important points. Um, so just to close up, uh, we have nine minutes left. Um, but I just wanted to ask you all um, what it is that State of California Salmon, other organizations and listeners can do to support your work. And then um, just any way you want to close out, conclude um, the conversation, feel free to do so. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could just, I'll just could speak what it, since it's on the top of my head, it's as far as like legislation and policy work. Um, I think a lot of legislators, they go into the, that sort of field because they want to help the people and maybe they lose their way along the way, but most of them, you know, are trying to help the people and the people of California. But if you can tell your legislators or the people in power to include tribes, because a lot of them think that when they're creating legislation for housing or violence prevention, that tribes are included. But if tribes aren't explicitly written into the legislation or the guidelines, they're not included and they cannot apply for those that same funding. So just keep tribes in the forefront, include them in the work you're doing, con uh, do consultation and uh, there are tribes everywhere and we want to partner and we're here to create solutions and find those solutions, but we need to be at the table. And I totally agree with that. I mean, that that is, you know, from the policy forefront, so important because so much of what we have to do is implemented by state policy, the legislation. And then we have to translate that down to various department and agencies, the grant funding world, all all the all the areas. But what I what I um, the question is how how can you know, your listeners support my particular work? And we we um, as a state agency, we're always making the ask to tribes. We need your review of this. Here's a deadline, and it's oftentimes without compensation. And so the support would be yes, we're willing to help, but but you know the the recognition of um, you know um, tribal expertise is is subject matter expertise, and that's also a policy direction we're taking. That um, tribal services is not just for cultural monitoring, protection of cultural resources, but it's it's participation in the whole entire policy process, which means reviewing documents, being part of developing new guidelines and new regulations. And then our job as state people is to make sure that that capacity building is, is supported. And we, we've created some amazing contracts to support that issues, which also inclu includes, you know, traditionalists and honored elders, if they are there advising the, the council or the youth as, as a subject matter expert. So that's, that's something that um, I know that we rely on so much in my job in terms of vetting information, new policy direction, and in participating on advisory committees. Thank you for that question. And that gives me a chance to make that ask. Um, 
I guess my advice would be, or my ask would be to um, to keep culture on the forefront. Culture is what really defines us. It is our, our core value system. And in terms of like funding and trying to go after these bigger things that we want, we kind of get, we kind of get, um, the culture goes on to the back burner sometimes because it's not easy to fund and, um, and then you just think it's always going to be there. So, um, so it's just, to me, it's the most important thing. It's the driver for what we're doing in the first place. And then, um, and so keeping that in mind and making sure that you're doing things that keep it on the forefront in order for the next generation to take it up and have the same access or more access to it than, than we had, um, I think is of utmost importance. And then for me, it would be one, if you're non-native to take some time and learn about whose land you're on and whose land you occupy. And there's a lot of good resources out there learn more about the gold mining history specifically too in California, because unfortunately, if you grew up in California or just in the United States in general, I don't think we, any of us got a sufficient education when it came to Native American history and about where we live. And so taking that time to learn and then taking the time to go to Native American events and make some Native American friends, you know, at powwows, at big time, et cetera. And get a better chance to understand current struggles and you know a lot of the stuff and things we go through you won't hear publicized on the news on NBC or Fox each night you'll only really get the depth of it through having friends and family that you care about in the community and so making those connections and reaching out even though it's awkward when you start out and also like right I, I have a really bad like resting me to face where like I look really mean if <laughs> I'm busy, but not being afraid to like be friendly and say hi. Um, <laughs> Cause I, I swear we're really friendly once you get to know us. And also for those who are native again, like, you know, knowing that there is a future here for us and that your land loves you, that your community loves you. And that I want to be here with you as I'm sure all these other people are and that you might not know the impact you make in your decisions now. But for example, I know just about everyone here um, who's on this panel from my tribe, you know, each one of you have made an impact in my life growing up, even if it was just, you know, through seeing your Facebook posts or what you're doing. So knowing that the younger generation is watching and that you making strides for yourself in the community helps all of us too. And I just in general that, you know, helping support organizations like Save California Salmon. They do a lot of good work and I really appreciate them for inviting me to this event. And that there is a tomorrow that's gonna happen and we get to shape it. And I think that's really exciting. And the more of us who get into science and policy, the more that we'll be able to take hand and part in that shaping. And if you have questions about academia too, like feel free to reach out to me on my social medias because I never thought I was gonna be a PhD student and now I, I literally get to go to school and fish for two years straight to try to figure out how to better protect our salmon. Like if you told me in elementary school that fishing could be a part of my college degree, I'd be like, that's wild. No way. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like something I get to do and I'm still really excited about it. So, right. We, anything you want to do, I think you should first step is believing in it and then let me know how I can support you making that a reality. Um, for me, I definitely kind of wrap in with uh, Dawn and Brooke here, um, you know, keeping, keeping cultural activities alive, um, you know, keep exercising our inherent rights within our ancestral lands, you know, keep these policymakers busy, you know, enabling us to get into these places to do what we need to do and should be doing. And, um, you know, when Brooke spoke to like non-native peoples, um, you know, we've had allies all the way through this. Um, one of my greatest teachers is a non-native guy and he's fought harder for us than just about anybody out there, Mr. Belchek, you know, um, we've got these people that, you know, fully see our visions and, um, yeah, you know, that you know, we, uh, allies exist, you know, all over the place. Um, so yeah, for me, Keep exercising those inherent rights. Um, uh, yeah. 
keep let's keep building policies. Let's keep these ladies busy. Let's, <laughs> you know, kind of speaks back to like when we were younger. Um, you know, I know a lot of what we did was, um, you know, illegal gathering and different things like that. But thanks to policy and thanks to actively getting out there and doing it, um, you know, it's not so illegal anymore. So, yeah. Thank you. Amazing. OK, um, well, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a super inspirational and amazing panel to hear from all of you. Um, I think it's definitely something that I'm going to go back and listen to the recording again, just because I loved all of your answers. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us and watched this amazing panel. And um, we will talk to you all soon. Thank you.